When you think of leaping compromise, what do you think of? Creeping compromise, all right, by somebody called Joe what? So by, by sometimes a message sounding like this, oh, it's going to sound very negative. But guess what? I got some good news to you. This is not a negative message. Amen? Amen. But what happens is this, Ray. How many of you in here are parents? Is correction negative? It's never negative. It's always positive. Now, remember when you were a child and your mother said, this is going to hurt me? I didn't believe that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But when I had to spank mine, I said, okay, I, I, now I understand. Amen? But we're not here to spank anybody, but we're here to present truth. Amen? As it is in Jesus. And I want to tell you, been a, I've been a seven-day Adventist for 20, this should be 25 years. Changed my life. Came right out, of, right out of high school. Didn't know where I was going. I just gave my life to the Lord, and I asked the Lord to show me the truth, and he did. And God had everything in place. I'm from Washington, D.C., so I live not too far from the General Conference. And it's so funny, I was dating a girl at that time, and when I was going to visit her, I drove past, and guess what I saw to my left? The General Conference building of Seven Day Adventists. I said, I'm going to join that denomination. <laughs> but the Lord led me to two Seven Day Adventist friends of mine that became, that one of them is a pastor right now. I met him 31 years ago playing a game of football. Now, I say 31 years ago, I am still a young man, so that was a teenager at that time. Amen. And I want to thank God for that friendship. Through that friendship, the Lord at the right time gave me this Adventist message, and my life has never been the same ever since. And right after I got baptized in 1990, right, I, didn't even, I wasn't fresh out the pool. And see, because I, well, I wanted to be an NBA basketball player, I wanted to be an entertainer, but the Lord said, through a member... You're called to the ministry. You need to be a minister. And that was the last thing I ever wanted to be. But I want to say, I thank God. I ran from the call for about a year. But I thank God I did accept the call and went to Heartland College, went to the seminary, and started pastoring five years after I got converted. And I've been in the seven-day Adventist ministry for the last 20 years, and it has been a glorious time. Amen. Pastoring right now in Gulf States Conference and now teaching in the religion and theology department at Oakwood. It has been a mountaintop experience. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. This message is sweet, amen, as it is in Jesus. And I want to take you to our opening text. Our theme text is in the book of Isaiah 62. And when God called me into the ministry, he wanted to tell me that I want you to lift up. I want you to do what the text says right here. And it has to be done in the spirit of love. Am I right, somebody? Amen. 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 It may not always sound loving, but let me tell you this right here. Messages like this, when done in the spirit of Christ, is love. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 62 and verse 10. Do you have it? All right. The Bible says in verse 10, go through, go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones and do what? Lift up a standard for the people. Because why? Because we're living in a day when we have a thing called leaping what, somebody? Compromise. And just from my study of the Bible and spirit of prophecy and just looking at Adventist history, we are living truly at the greatest crisis in the history of seven-day Adventism when the enemy is trying to shake the church. But I got some good news for you. The church may appear is about to fall, but the prophet says it's not going to what? But, the, and, but let me tell you this. It's going to remain while the sinners in Zion will be what? Sifted out. So what happens is this right here, and I want to really hit a, a point here because there are those who are concerned about the, um, the wrongs in the church, and rightfully so, and there are some who have taken a course of action which we're going to talk about today. Even though there's wrongs in the church, God's going to correct it. Am I right, somebody? And he has his God-ordained means. But one of the things we do not need to do is jump ship. Amen? Amen. We talked about this before, and we're going to, we're going to talk about this. Let me just kind of, kind of get past some things right here. God said, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of where, somebody? Out of the house of what? Bondage. And we said that Egypt is symbolic of the world. So what God has done is for each and every one of us, he's brought us out of Egypt, our own Egypt spiritually. He's taken us out by a mighty hand, and then he gives us his will. And after he converts us and shows us his will, the Bible says, after the doings of the land of where? 
Wherein ye dwelt shall ye not what, somebody? And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their what? So we covered in our first session that we don't go back where we came from, and, we, and while we are in the world, we're not to be of the world. Am I right, somebody? So what happens is this right here. When we understand this, then it makes it very understandable to understand a duplicity going on in the church. God's remnant church, which has what kind of values? Christian values, these values are to be absolute. Am I right, somebody? But we're living in a sinful what? That has what kind of values? And these cultural values are changing from generation to generation. Am I right? We don't even need to get into all that kind of stuff. But what happens is what we see is the cultural values have come into the where. And when this happens, what can happen? The Christian values can become what? Cultural and not just cultural, they become spiritualized. All you got to do is say Jesus to it and people will accept it. But what happens is this right here. God has given us principles that should separate us from the things of this world. Now, just want to show you this diagram right here. God brought the children of Israel out from under Pharaoh because the Egyptian society, the society of the world at that time, was centered in the Pharaoh, which is centered in what, somebody? Which leads to what kind of living? No wonder God said, let my people go that they may worship me because they couldn't worship God while they worship and while they serve in Pharaoh. So what happens is God had to bring them out. He had to show Pharaoh who the true God was first. Am I right, somebody? Amen. And then God brought them out to where they could be centered in whose word, which leads to what kind of living. So in these last days, it is very important that we live prophetically and not humanistically. But if we mingle the world with the church, guess what? That prophetic living can become fuzzy. And we're living in a day that things that used to be black and white have now become gray. Trust me, I, te I go through it all the time at Oakwood. Um, Pat, Pat, but, Pat, Pat, but Dr. Parker knows what I'm talking about. C.D. Brooks, how many of y'all know C.D. Brooks? Probably everybody's favorite preacher in here. He said, we're living in a time where we have to defend seven-day Adventism to our own people. And it is so true. And at Oakwood, I don't know how it is in Southern, my brother. Boy, back in the day, you could just tell it. Now you got to tell it, but you got to walk people through it, ask inductive questions, and help them to come to the conviction that you're trying to teach them from the Word of God. You got to, it's so many different ways of doing it today. But brothers and sisters, before we get into the moral compromises, let me tell you this right here. We got a race problem in the church that's got to stop. Am I right, somebody? Amen. Amen. Black and white, we say amen. You got people that are Eurocentric and nothing wrong with being Euro. Amen. Because guess what? I'm Afro. Are you with me? I'm black. Amen. But what happens is, is this right here. When people put their cultural, cultural things before God's word, we got some issues. Am I right, somebody? So you know what God's going to probably have to do to bring us together? bring on a time of trouble such as it never was. Amen. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the color line will be viewed in a matter different than what it is right now. Amen. And I'm glad God's going to take care of all that. This is some other stuff here I don't want to get into right now. But what happens, we understand that divine what? And human fundamental convictions will always be in what? Collision. That's why the Bible says come out from among them and be ye what? And touch not the unclean what? thing is the reason why he told us this now we're not going to get we already talked about this but do you know this young man right here he is resting in jesus i believe amen made a great impact upon my life he wrote a book called creeping what the shocking story of satan's a sneak attack on the standards of in the what church and it was he wrote this book at the time when the church was going through a terrible time with the desmond Ford crisis to where i mean the things that so how many y'all been adventists for i'm not trying to have you give your age out, but more than 40 years. Okay, so you know that, I mean, a lot of things that we took for granted, Desmond Ford and others came in and started dismantling it. People started leaving the faith. There were others that stayed in the faith, said we're going to try to change the denomination. And let me tell you this, from personal experience, from just going around the world, we still have not completely recovered from the Desmond Ford crisis. So what happens is, and it's driven me to the scriptures, and let me tell you this right now, the Internet was not around in 1980. Am I right, somebody? But it's around in 2015. And let me tell you, there's a lot of negative things about the seven day of in his church, our doctors and Auntie Ellen. I'm going to write somebody. And if you're not rooted and grounded, you may believe in some of that stuff. I've had to talk to students that have left the church now and try to show them. Here it is right here. But the evidence they think is so overwhelming 
They must think I don't know what I'm talking about. And people are leaving by the droves. Do you understand this right here? So the Internet is doing a lot of damage. But let me tell you this right here. God will have a remnant. Amen. And I want to tell you, when you study this truth as it is in Jesus, you will know that the doctrines that we hold are present truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank God for Joe Cruz's contribution. But let me tell you, if he was living today, the compromising, the compromise is not creeping. It is what, somebody? Leaping. I used to play basketball. In order to dunk, you got to jump really high. Am I right, somebody, right? So what happens is it's leaping now. And let me tell you this right here. The Bible says, remove not the ancient what? Wish thy fathers have what? Set. And let me tell you this right here. This is not a perfect church, even though this is God's remnant church. Amen. They had their trials and tribulations back in the day. But let me tell you this right here from my study of the Bible. Now, how many fundamental beliefs do we have? Twenty eight. Now, it may be really more than that, because, you know, as, other th- as God gives the church more light. But let me tell you this right here. The doctrines we hold are the truth. And let me tell you this right here. What brought me into this church? Of course, was Jesus Christ, but it's that straight, unadulterated three angels messages. You hear me? And it gives me pride to I am proud to be a seven day Adventist in 2015. Amen. 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 And we should not hold our heads up and not look. We should not look down at other people that are not of our faith, but it should let us know that to whom much is given, much is what required. So it's a very fearful thing. But what's going on is the landmarks that have made us a people are being removed. And brothers and sisters, we talked about a man named who? Who is symbolic of God's remnant people. He had a mission. Am I right? A mission of deliverance to deliver the children of Israel out of the bondage of the heathen. Am I right, somebody? But God gave some stipulations. Number one, his his diet was to be strict. Am I right? You read the scriptures, right? But secondly, he was not to do what to his hair. Because that hair is an identification. Am I right? Am I right? And notice this right here. We talked about the lion. Now, did he kill the lion with his bare hands? Did he do it because he was so strong? Oh, no. He did it because he had the what, somebody? The power of God. The scripture says the spirit of God came mightily upon him. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible makes it very plain that Samson killed a lion with his bare hands. Meaning that symbolically, we as Christians cannot overcome the lion, the devil. Who's walking about as a roaring what? And we cannot overcome him unless we have the power of the what? Without the spirit of God, Jesus says, without me, you can do what, somebody? Nothing in your spiritual life. But watch this right here. We as God's remnant people, as we seek to win souls from darkness into the wondrous light, we cannot do it unless we have the holy what? Because the source of Samson's strength was the what? And but the symbol of his strength was his what? That was his distinction. And you know that the source of our strength is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to pray for this power every single day. Wasn't Christ our example to where he prayed for hours at night, praying for a fresh anointing of the spirit of God? And we're told in the spirit of prophecy that as we go before the Lord and meditate before him, often will our hearts burn within us as we feel his loving presence upon us. We need that experience on a daily basis. Do you understand this right here? And let me make a confession. I've been a minister for 20 years now. I've been a teacher for almost 10. But now it is more harder for me to read my Bible now than it was when I first came in the church. I'm not saying I don't study my Bible. I still do. But it's more of an effort. Is there a witness up in here? Okay, I feel better now. But watch this right here. So this honeymoon period in my Adventist experience has been way over. And what happens is this right here. The enemy is going to put darts in your life to where it's going to try to cause you to leave God. But I want to tell you this right here. Don't give up on God because he did not give up on you. Amen. Look, have anybody ever had their own Garden of Gethsemane experience? Lord, take this cup away from me. Am I right? I mean, Jesus was human, but yet he submitted to the father's will. He said, nevertheless, not my what, but thy will be what done. And God strengthened him. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you, the symbol of our strength is the three angels' messages, the everlasting gospel. And didn't Paul say that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? Unto everyone that believeth. You know what our distinction, our hair is? Our hair is our message. And watch this right here. When we cut off our hair, we lose our power. And guess what? The devil said, okay, I can't defeat him with the Philistine men, so I'm going to use a woman. And guess what? You know, Samson has some women problems. Am I right? And he knew she wasn't right because he was a Hebrew, right? 
And in the Aramaic, her name meant seductive. So he knew her she wasn't right. Every time he called her name, he was saying seductive. And let me tell you this. Is the world seductive? Are these false doctors in these fallen churches seductive? And didn't the Bible say in the last days many will give heed to what kind of spirits? Seducing what? Spirit. There's some spirits out there that are seducing. Am I right? And there's some teachings that are very seductive. And if you're not rooted and grounded in what we believe as seven day Adventists from the word of God and the righteousness of Christ, you will be swept from your foundation. And what happens is the devil has sought to bring in a spirit of compromise. So guess what happens? He had an ecumenical alliance. He had a worldly alliance. Yes, he had his vegetarian diet right here. Are you with me? It was a pure diet. Have mercy. But watch this right here. And he gave up his, stop saying his birthright per se, but he was not supposed to tell anybody what the secret of his strength was. Am I right? Am I right? And he told the wrong person and thought that she loved him, right? Well, first of all, the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, don't you intermarry with the heathen. Am I right? Now, he wasn't married to her, but he was practically on his way. Am I right, somebody? And guess what? The Bible said if you do it, they will turn away your heart from following me. And the wrong woman led to him to get his hair cut off. And the Bible says that how many locks of his head was cut off? Seven. We're going to talk about those seven locks right now. And the Bible says that when his locks were cut off, she began to do what to him? Afflict him. And let me tell you, when will Adventism be afflicted in the last days? At the National Sunday Law. He's saying this right here. Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 5, the church will be sifted by fiery trials. He's saying this right here. And so what happens is the devil wants seven-day Adventism to shave off our distinction. Have mercy. To where when the affliction comes, just as his strength left, we will have no strength, no power to win the world for Christ. And we talked about the seven locks of seven-day Adventism. Can we talk about the seven locks? The first and most important lock is salvation and righteousness by what? Faith. For by grace are we saved through what? But notice this right here. That saving grace teaches us in Titus to deny ungodliness. So that grace, this is right here, is a two-sided coin where it saves us unconditionally and it gives us power over the enemy. Amen? Then the second lock, the law of God and the what, somebody? Number three, health what? Reform as it is, not health deform. Amen. No extremism. Amen. Number four, the what kind of message? Our beautiful sanctuary message where Jesus is our sacrificial priest at the Holy of Holies. Amen. Making an atonement for the blotting out of the sins in the sanctuary. Number five, the state of the what? This is extremely important. You know that, right? It's, you must know what happens to a man after they die, right? Because the enemy is going to come in. The spirit of prophecy. Number six. And number seven, the true understanding of the second coming of what? Christ. Cut off these seven locks, we have no power. Amen. This is some serious stuff. So what happened was, he was shocked. He was surprised. The time when he needed the strength of God the most was when, watch this right here, the time he needed God's strength was when he compromised. And let me tell you this right here. The enemy wants this denomination to compromise its distinction, its doctrines, its life. Everything it stands for as it is in Jesus. So there'll be nobody to stand before him when the time of trouble comes. That's why Ellen White says there has to be how much compromise? With those who are worshiping an idol what? I was told that men will employ every what? To make less prominent the difference between the faith of seven-day Adventists and those who observe the first day of the what? We, we talked about this. She says there's no time to haul down our what? Colors. So what happens is the enemy wants to bring in a spirit of compromise, lay the same lukewarmness to where we lower our standard, have mercy, as it is in Jesus, to where there's no distinction, where we have no power. But let me tell you this right here. Did Samson know when he told him his secret that this was going to happen to him? As soon as he told her, he should have broke camp. Am I right? But he got comfortable. And notice the scripture says that when he got his hair cut, he was sleeping. Am I right, somebody? While the bridegroom tarried, all the virgins slumbered and what, somebody? Slept. Brother, it's time for us to wake up because let me tell you, I'm a light sleeper. Any light sleepers up in here? Are there any heavy sleepers up in here? I mean, it could be thundering outside. Somebody could yell at you, slap you in the face, you still be sleeping. Well, if you're that good of a sleeper, I wish I could be like you because if you whisper my name in the house or anywhere, I won't wake up. But let me tell you this. He was in a deep sleep. And notice what the Bible says, that he got his eyes cut, cut out. Am I right, somebody? And we're going to talk about what those eyes is in a second. And let me share this with you. 
because of his compromises, this was, it led to his downfall. And what I want you to know, that the lovely Jesus says, take what? And beware of the leaven of the what? And the leaven of what? Now, the Bible says the kingdom of God is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of what? Till the whole was leavened. And in Bible prophecy, a woman equals a what? So this leaven is the gospel of Christ, according to the Bible and spirit of prophecy, where we hide in three measures of meal. And didn't God give us three measures of meal? First, second, and third angels' messages as it is in Christ. Till the whole was leavened, to where the gospel has to have complete control, not just of our heads. Because let me tell you, there are a whole lot of intellectual Adventists who are not in Christ. Am I right, somebody? We have to be heart Adventists. Am I right, somebody? To where that religion has to be from the head to the heart. Never going to forget what Joe Cruz said. It really stuck in my mind. He said, many are going to miss heaven by 18 inches from the head to the heart. I don't want to. I don't. Let me tell you, I, well, I used to be a football fan. I remember one time the Cleveland Browns were going to the Super Bowl. First and goal on the one yard line. Now, if it's 54 seconds, you're watching a football game. Your team is on the one yard line. You are pretty much sure they're going to go in, right? Not all the time. They gave it to the running back, and the running back fumbled it at the one-yard line. And the other team got it, and they went to the Super Bowl. Are you with me? I don't want to fumble my, my Jesus. Are you with me? At the last minute. Do you understand this right here? So therefore, stay away from Delilah. Amen? Watch this right here. Self-righteousness is the danger of this what? It separates the soul from who? Those who trust in their own what? It's the leaven now cannot understand how salvation comes through Christ. They call sin what? And righteousness what? They have no appreciation of the evil of what? No understanding of the terror of the law, for they do not respect God's moral standard. That's just the reason why there are so many spurious what? In these last days, is there, there is so low an appreciation of God's law. And the law of God is the character of Christ. Am I right? But Christ is the law in human form. Instead of God's standard of righteousness, men have erected a what, somebody? I don't care whether you're liberal, conservative, moderate, whatever they want, these man-made terms you want to call people. People are erecting their own standard of their own by which to measure their own characters. And there is nobody in this room spiritual enough for me to measure you by or vice versa. We got to measure ourselves by that man called Jesus Christ. Amen. And whatever he tells us to do, he's going to be judged by that word. And we need to come up to it through faith in Jesus. This leaven. Now, Jesus said the, the leaven of the Pharisees is what? I've seen people preach a powerful message only to contradict the very message they talked about. I had a minister one time years ago. This is terrible. You know, preached a powerful sermon on health reform, talking about leaving certain articles alone. We went out after that sermon that evening, um, it was during the week, and only to buy the very thing that he preached about two hours before. And I'm sitting down, I'm here trying to be faithful. I'm like, what is he doing? The leaven of hypocrisy. Are you with me? And if we're not careful, those hypocrisies will catch up to us. Do you understand this right here? So that's the reason why I tell my church, God's not going to hold us accountable by what everybody else does around here. God's going to hold us accountable for what we do here. Amen? Watch this right here. The leaven of the Sadducees is those who are what? Half converted. That's a leaven too. And then the heaven of Herod is just straight out worldliness among God's people. So this leaping compromise isn't just on the liberal end. It's on all ends. Do you understand this right here? The slightest deviation from strict integrity cannot meet God's approval. Am I right, somebody? The prophet Lord says that. So what happens is this right here. I may not be doing outward stuff, but let me tell you, if I'm doing stuff in my own closet or in my own heart, I'm failing Christ. So what happens is this right here. This leaven that's causing this leaping compromise is really a heart issue. The refusal to surrender the heart to Christ's will. You can say this right here. And let me just say this. There are some things we don't all come to the same understanding at the same time in the same way. So sometimes we have to leave room for people to grow. Am I right, somebody? But let me tell you, on the fundamental truths that have made us who we are as a people, we cannot compromise. And let me tell you this. The Bible says, and the dragon was what, somebody? With the woman and went to make war with who? That last day remnant, which keep the what? Commandments of God and have the testimony of what? So if you connected to Christ, the devil's going to be after you. Am I right, somebody? And let me share this with you. 
Yes, there's problems in the seven day Adventist church. And I want to tell you, I've had the privilege to bring people back into the church that hated the church so much. They said, take my name off the books. I ain't paying my time to this organization no more. But to help reclaim them back. Amen. To let them know that God has people that do love the Lord. That's why we got to tell you, man, you can't give up on this church. And let me tell you this right here. The seven day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Don't you ever forget that. Amen. I mean, if we, if, if, if we don't know who we are now, then anybody can name us. And if anybody can name us, we will answer to anything. We got to believe what God has called us to be. That's who we are. Am I right, somebody? Amen. Now, watch this right here. Thank God for Ted Wilson. People trying, like they're trying to stand. Let me tell you this. Let me get to this right here. I want to hit this right here because um, this is a whole lot of stuff right here. All right. Now, because what happens is our job as seven day Adventists are to call God people from out of the world. Am I right? And out of spiritual Babylon, the scripture says, come out of her, my what? People. So what happens by cutting our hair, by cutting our distinction, guess what? If we're not careful, we won't be calling as many people out as we used to. Do you understand this right here? And what happens is you have some who try to join up with them. Do you understand this right here? So what happens is this right here. We must understand, but there's some people in the seven day Adventist church. You know, they got three types of Adventists. You got the sad Adventist. And you got the bad Adventist. And to be honest with you, the ones that brought me to the church, they were bad Adventists. But you got some mad Adventists in the church. They mad at everybody. They mad at the conference. They mad at everybody. I mean, talking about Ted Wilson's a Jesuit and stuff like that. I mean, come on. I mean, just, please, I mean, take this too far. You hear me? But watch this right here. They're so mad. You got folk calling the church Babylon to where the spirit of prophecy says that those who assert at the seven day of any church is constitute Babylon or any part of Babylon. Might as better well stay home. Amen. I had a guy tell me, I could see why she said don't call it back then, but if she was living today, she would call it Babylon. No, she, no, no, no. It's the remnant, amen. It's, a layer, it's in a layer to see condition, but there's still hope for layer to see. Am I right, somebody, right? <laughs> amen. I got to hit this right here. I got to talk about this right here. Uh, and, oh, wow. Because the whole world is to be stirred with what, somebody? Stay on the ship against seven day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the what? By honoring Sunday. And this thing is right on the horizon. Some of you saw what that lady said two weeks ago. She didn't know what she was saying. But when I saw it, I said, oh, man, this thing's closer to what I think. And then the Pope come in the Congress and then they talking about legalizing gay marriage now. Oh, I thought they was going to leave us religious folk alone. But now you got Indiana and Arkansas and other states saying we need to have some religious liberty laws to protect ourselves from being sued. Am I right, somebody? And that's not enough. Let me tell you, if this thing passes, we're going to be in a different habit. We're going to be in a different world pretty soon in a couple of months. And we're going to see the moral breakdown of society go down more and more. Where they are, It's going to almost look like having a day of rest would make sense. I say almost makes sense. I didn't say it would make sense. Amen. Watch this right here. Now, this is the Pope. Got some other stuff on here. Not going to get into this right here. But watch this right here. Oh, this is deep. Ellen White prophesied. Now, is Ellen White a prophet? Yes. So what she wrote is a prophecy. Now, I got to read this to you. Now, the Bible says lift up a standard. Am I right, somebody? Amen. The church, the seven day of the church is not Babylon. Am I right, somebody? Amen. The Bible says there'll be wheat and what? Yes. Sheep and goats. Saints and ants. Am I right, somebody? In the church till the end of time. God says that the angels will separate them. Am I right, somebody? It is not my job to separate anybody. My job is to preach the truth as it is in Jesus. Am I right, somebody? Now, let me share this with you. God is not calling me to preach bedtime sermons or bedtime stories. Now, how many of y'all told a bedtime story to your child to put them to sleep? You rub their stomach. And there's a thing on Facebook where a lady just throws a cloth over the baby's face and make the child sleep within 40 seconds. That's kind of um, unique. But the bottom line is this right here. There are people preaching bedtime sermons. In other words, putting people to sleep in sin. Are you with me? That is not my job. My job is to preach Christ and his commandments. Are you with me? And his will. For I delight to do thy will. Oh my God. Yea, thy law is where? And brothers, and when it's in your heart to obey God, that is not legalism. Amen. amen. See, when, for those that are married, happily married. Amen. You know, you shouldn't commit adultery, but you love your wife so much. You love your husband so much. You're not even thinking about the law. Are you with me? Right. Because you love the person. Am I right? So when we love Jesus by being married to Christ, yes, there are commandments. Yes, 
there's his will to follow. We're so in love with Jesus. It's like what Ellen White said when the, when the devil told the angels of God that there was a law. They were like, there's a law? Because they were so in love with Christ. You understand this right here, amen? When the Sabbath comes in, we ain't think, oh, I got to stop doing this on the Sabbath. We just gladly bring it in. Am I right? You know, so what happens? It's a balance. Now, Ellen White prophesied the enemy of what? Has sought to bring in the supposition that a great what? Or change. Because let me tell you something. When Desmond Ford got kicked out, he told a lot of his followers, stay within so you can change it from within. You understand this right here? And let me tell you this right here. I don't know who's a Fordite or who's not a Fordite, but let me tell you, I do see a change. You understand this right here? And I came when the changes were really beginning to accelerate, and I always had my mind made up, I'm going to stand though the heavens fall. Watch this right here. And a great reformation was to take place among seven-day Adventists, but that this reformation would consist in giving up the what? Which stands as the pillars of our what? And there are people who do not believe in our doctrines. And they'll say yes with their mouth, but they'd be lying. They're in false witness in heaven. He's at right here. That's why it's very important um, to really screen who comes before us. Because let me tell you this right here. A degree does not make you qualified to pastor. Are you with me? It's your spiritual commitment to Jesus. Amen. And the bottom line is, if I came to the Catholic church to be a Catholic priest, I have to believe in their theology, right? What about someone trying to change y'all doctrine? Man, the Pope, he's not God and stuff like that. They wouldn't let me be a priest, would they? If I wanted to be a Mormon, I got to believe in Joseph Smith. Am I right? And some of the other stuff that just really like, where did he get that from? Because what happens is this right here. Can two walk together except they be what? If I was to be a Pentecostal minister, I better start saying something in tongues. Am I right, somebody, right? Even if I don't know the Bible, I better say, what's your Honda and all that kind of stuff. Am I right, somebody? So if the not other denominations are strict on their requirements, shouldn't we hold a standard on who should stand before our people? Because what happens is, is that when you bring people who are not as committed to the message, souls will be de deceived. And I'm not going to mention any, any stories, but I've had people tell, I had a student tell me one time, the church owes Desmond Ford an apology based on how he was taught by a professor. Are you with me? That's very serious. Watch this right here. And that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stands the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of what? She said, were this reformation to take place, what would happen? And this is why we got to stand against the leaping compromise. The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be what? There, there are things that are on paper that are not necessarily preached anymore. I mean, I talk about it in the classroom. This, this last week I dealt with the issue, which we're going to talk about for a couple of minutes. And my attitude is this right here. I, took, I said, young people, look, I'm not blaming nobody. I'm just giving you some information. There's some things, some things that have not been handed down to you or not been given down the right way or has been muddied over. I'm going to give you some information. The way, you got, the way I got to talk to these young people is, look, here's the truth. Ask them the right questions. Make you a good, conscientious decision based on the truth. And then they will appreciate it. But she says they will be discarded. And then our religion, oh, this is very serious, our religion would be what? Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Changes have taken place from within. You understand this right here? And as C.D. Brooks said, we got to defend Adventism to our own people no more because a lot of folks do not believe. And just, just well, I'm going to tell you this as I go on. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as what? Then it says a new organization would be what? Not so much a physical organization, but a thought, a way of thinking. Watch this right here. Then books of a what kind of order would be what? Written, dumbing down our faith, and the system of intellectual what? Would be introduced. Yes, I have a doctorate. Dr. Parker has a doctorate. But let me tell you this right here. We're all brethren in here. Amen? Amen? But let me tell you this right here. There are people that will not accept anything from anybody in here unless you have letters next to your name. Oh, did you study theology? Oh, you're not a theologian. So therefore, what you say ain't reliable. But the Bible says when the spirit of truth has come, who is the great mentor? He will guide you into how much truth? You know who the greatest theologians are? Those y'all in this room, am I right? And what is a theologian? Somebody who knows Jesus, am I right? If you know Christ, you are a theologian, though you may not have letters next to your name. Amen? In the broadest sense. Watch this right here. The founders of this system will go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly what? 
as also the God who created it, and nothing will be a what? Allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, it's like an iceberg. And she had a dream of an iceberg. I'm not going to read the statement to you. Some of you have read it before. What happened was, I know it's going away from it, but she was going forward, and the captain said, do what to it? For those who read it. She, oh, let me just read it to you. Watch this right here. Iceberg just ahead, and there towering high above the ship was a gigantic iceberg, an authoritative voice cried out, do what? That means you got to deal with it. You got problems in your marriage, you got to deal with it. Am I right? Am I right? A lot of, you got families, they got problems in their home, they want to rush it under the rug, and they want to use sex, and going out to the movie, or going out to on a date to cover it up, but the best thing to do is to talk about it. Am I right? Am I right, somebody? But what happens is we got to meet it. We got to deal with it. If you got people teaching that there's no sanctuary in heaven, we got to deal with that. Am I right, somebody? If you got people dumbing down what we believe and trying to cause people to believe that the things that you once taught are not true and you know it's true, it has to be dealt with. But brushing it under the bug does not change anything. Do you understand it? It only makes it worse. If you knew you got cancer, what you going to do? You're going to deal with it. Am I right, somebody, right? You're going to go hopefully to a, a naturopath that can help you get healed naturally. Am I right, somebody? Or some other way. You're going to deal with it because you want to live. Am I right, somebody? Watch this right here. There was not a moment's what? It was time for what kind of action? The engineer put on full steam and the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into. Where did he go? What? But God, if God said it, he's going to see you through it, right? With a crash, he struck the ice. There was a fearful shock. And the iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with a noise like a thunder on the deck. But let me ask you a question. Did the ship sink? Did it sink? Watch this right here. It says the passengers were violently what? By the force of the collisions. But notice this right here. No lives were lost. You know why? Because they stayed in the ship. Amen. And I have friends that are part of independent churches. And I've had to tell some of them that's not God's plan. <clears throat> Spirit of prophecy said, and let me, let, me, let me show you why. She puts a principle here. And in the Adventist church, we have what's called a representative form of government where uh, people are transferred. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Sister White says that it's not God's will for the same man to be in a district year after year after year after year after year. He should be transferred. But in an independent congregationalist system, he's there for life. Am I right? That's not God's plan right there. That was texting somebody today to let them know that is not God's plan, and they thank me for it. But watch this right here. That's why we got to stay in the ship. It says the, the vessel was what? But not beyond what? Repaired, and then she said it went forward to glory. She said, I well knew the meaning of this representation. I had my orders. I had heard the words like the voice from our captain do what? I knew what my duty was, and there was no, not a moment to what? For a time for what kind of action? Had come, I must, without delay, obey the command, meet it. And that was at a time of the alpha of apostasy when John Harvey Kellogg was sweeping a lot of people away from the faith with pantheism, even to the point where E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones, meaning that God used in 1888, were on board. I mean, it was getting everybody. But what happened was she had to meet it and call it for what it was. And let me tell you something. The church survived the alpha. But I want to share this with you. She also prophesied of another time that will come. She prophesied of the omega of apostasy. And I believe that the leaping compromise that's going on in the church is a result of the omega of apostasy prophesied by Ellen White. Now, let me share this with you. When I share this information with you, I know you should know by now that I'm not being negative on the church. Amen? Amen. I'm only bringing out what prophecy has foretold. And when you preach this stuff, you got to be balanced because we're told, be not what? Many will depart from the what? And I'm seeing people leave this thing. I mean, there are people that were once staunch Adventists who are no longer walking with us. Do you understand this right here? One reason or another, they have left. And I'm like, and I mean, there are some that have left. I'm like, made me wonder, Lord, am, am I in the right church? But I had to go back to the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Giving heed to what? The reason why they're departing is because they're giving heed to what kind of spirits? And doctrines of what? We have now before us the alpha of this danger, but the omega will be of the most star. It would be worse than the alpha. And the alpha was really centralized in North America, maybe parts of Europe. But this omega is taking place worldwide to where we have seen a different facelift of seven day Adventism. 
Watch this right here. The omega of apostasy has what? The standards of biblical Adventist lifestyle and what? Worship. Now, let me just say this with you. Let me share this with you. I'm just going to talk about maybe two, three things that has really changed the facial structure of our beloved church. And let me tell you, it's causing many of our people to stay at home. Have mercy. And I'm like, have mercy. To where you got people that are tipping, dipping, swinging, singing, sinning, and what else, somebody? What am I talking about? People have made the church a club. Am I right? They're taking worldly music. I mean, music from the world. I mean, I'm like, I'm like, how can you bring this in the church? They bring in rock. They bring in jazz. They bring in rap music into the church. And am I right? And, and, and it's going on, right? And if you say anything against it, then you're a fanatic. Am I right? But no, the Bible says the Lord is in his what? Let all the earth what? Now, the Bible does say make a joyful noise. Am I right, somebody? The Bible does say use instruments. The Bible does talk about it, but the Bible makes it very plain that he is to be reverenced. Am I right? If I came into your house, and if it's, if it's your um, rule for me to take off my shoes, and I come up, I ain't no wrong with that, and walk in your house with your shoes, that's in reference for your house. Am I right? Now, God is not required to take off our shoes when we come into his house, but he wants to come with a holy attitude. Am I right? And there are just some things you know intuitively that should not be in the church. Am I right? And what's happening is, is this right here. People, in order to get new members, as I said before, there are people that have a Walmart marketing mentality when it comes to church growth. They lower the price in order to bring in more customers. And yes, you may bring in a lot of people. But what happens is this right here. God holds us in account on how he brought the people in. Am I right? Spirit of Prophecy says in evangelism that God will be pleased if six were converted to the truth, then 60 who were not converted. What does Sister White say about this? The things you have described is taking place where? You know what happened in Indiana? Make a long story short, I have it on another PowerPoint. They were mimicking the Pentecostal services of their time. They were bringing in the music from the world, playing dance tunes to sacred words to have a carnival. She said, these things would take place just before the what? Every uncle thing would be what? In other words, it's going to get wild in the church. I mean, people doing some stuff. I'm like, man, do they have the fear of the Lord? There will be what? With what? Music and wealth. And what else? Is it going on today? And the, now maybe 10, 15 years ago, the question was, who has it in the church? Today, the question is, who doesn't have it? Am I right, somebody? And what happens is this right here. One of my fellow theologians in my department, um, I'm not going to mention his name, but he told me, he said, Isaac, he said, I got to be honest with you. When I go to church now, I feel like I'm being punished. They're bringing all this wild music there, this pulsating, syncopated, demonic beats that do not come from Christ. Am I right? Now, is God saying we got to be, we got to sing dead? Bless the Lord. Oh, my. Son. No, we put life into that. We're told not to sing funeral hymns. But people have taken that so far, they feel it's a track meet around the church. Am I right, somebody? She says the senses of rational beings have become so what? To where they cannot be trusted to make what kind of decisions? And this will be called the moving of the what? The Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to hit it. I'm just going to just really be real. But can I just be honest with you? In the African-American churches, it's really prevalent. And because I work at a, you know, Oakwood, you know, it's predominantly black. Rather than me tell them what this means, I ask them what it means. You know what the majority of students say? I say, is this going on right now? They say, yes. I said, can you tell me three to five places what is going on? 95% of them will say it's going on at this church, this church, that church, and this church. Why? Because what happened, I want them to think for themselves. You understand this right here? I don't want nobody to ever say that Dr. O said it. Are you with me? I want them to say the doctor old read it to me. Are you with me? But what happens is this right here. The worship styles have changed. I mean, I know Ivor Myers and other people, Christian Badal, has done some beautiful things on music. Don't want to get into that right here. But let me tell you this right here. When we get to heaven, it's going to be sacred. Am I right, somebody? And yet it's going to be euphoric now. But at the same time, it's not going to be worldly. And we're living in a day when people feel that we have to compromise the standards of music to bring people into the church. 
And let me tell you, I used to be a clubber. I used to be into hip hop, R&B, all that stuff. And when I came into the church, I knew. And this, this was the biggest thing for me to let go. Because it was, a, I thought that being a man was the music I listened to, the parties, and all that stuff. But God brought me out from that to enjoy sacred music. But guess what? Didn't God say that we're to be a what kind of people? Including in our music. Am I right? To be a young man, a young black man in urban America, whatever, and not listening to this kind of music. Amen? It's weird to some people. Am I right, somebody? They didn't hear me listen to songs of Zion and stuff like that. But see, the world is so bold with theirs. Why can't we be bold for Jesus? Amen? Yes, I'm blind. I'm blast my Jesus music up. Amen? Amen. But what happens is this right here. When the standard, now, this is the truth. I got to tell you. Can I tell you the truth on this? I really can't water this down now. What happens is it, the compromise has been leaping on the music. But let me tell you this. When the music starts getting wild and more contemporary for our young people, for, they forget how to dress to a church. Because if the music sounds like the, if the, music sounds like the club, then guess what? They dress accordingly. And where? Let's keep, can, I, can I talk about this right here? We seven day of innocent here, right? We leave in the Bible spirit of prophecy, right? Jewelry, jewelry, and even more jewelry. Am I right, somebody? Am I right? Well, it was a time, and let me just let me just put a disclaimer again. We're saved completely by the grace of God. You know that, right? But we are to be distinctive. Am I right? God has given us his will, Dina Sanders right here. To show distinctiveness from everybody else. And that is what attracts. If I be lifted up, Jesus says. Am I right? Not only through the preaching of the word, but by the lifestyle of Christ. I will draw how many men unto me? All men unto me. When they see that you look different, you dress different, you act, you even eat different. Am I right, somebody? And dress different from the world. And you have the spirit of Jesus. So you got to put the spirit of Jesus in there. It's like a magnet. Like, you mean to tell me, and look at for such a lot of ladies now, this issue of dress, it cuts across that vanity of the human heart. Am I right? In a world where the world says you got to dress sexy to be a woman, God says, I want you to be modest. Dean Sanders right here. And in order to do that, for men and women, we got to deny who? Yourself. And take up your what? And do what? People want. As I said before, people love the Savior, but they hate the Lord. Let me say that one more time. People love the Savior, but they hate the Lord. They love the Savior for saving them, but when it comes to him being the Lord of how we live, they don't want that Jesus. But Jesus says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall be saved. It's they which do the what? A husband can tell his wife, I love you all you want, all he wants. But you know, ladies, love, love, love is not a noun. It's a verb. Am I right? Every woman in there knows that. Honey, I love you, but I love her too. That's not love. Am I right, somebody? Love is I love you and all your ladies leave me alone. Am I right? And you show her. Am I right? Amen. Amen. All right. But what happens is this right here. Now, who's this man? Right? Does anybody who knows who this man is? The most, one of the most popular bishops, pastors in the world. They call him the, the black Billy Graham. And what does he have in his ear? What is a pastor doing trying to look all hip with a ring in his ear? We got a conference president in here. Imagine the president of the conference with an A ring in his ear. Like, what? <laughs> Even the white, like, oh, the yogi was saying, oh, he's, we got a cool president, right? <laughs> but man, let me tell you this right here. There's so much other stuff in here. What has he got an earring in his ear? And what happens is this right here, it may look cute to you, but brother, I shouldn't be seeing your belly button. Am I right? That's when I get up to preach and bam, right in my face. Like, oh, let me go back and pray, right? <laughs> the Bible, you know, the Bible gives a principle that we are brother's keeper. Am I right, somebody, right? We got to be careful. And the reason why God gave us a standard on dress is to protect us, men and women. Am I right? Amen. Women to dress modestly and the men to be modest. Amen? Amen. I mean, instead of men whistling and saying, girl, you look so good, why can't a man just say, you look so spiritual today. You look so holy. Keep doing what you're doing, sister. I'm praying for you. Well, that's corny, right? That's corny. I tell the students that at Oakwood, man, they be laughing when I tell them that. But I'm just being real with you. Brothers and sisters, the standard of dress has gone down, and you got praise teams, and they be up there singing. Am I right? And what happens is this right here. Some of us got to put sunglasses on, so we just, or just bend our heads down so we just won't 
look, I'm all right. So what happens is where God has to stand in on dress, and let me tell you something, it's going buck wild, and people don't know how to dress anymore. These mini skirts, the spirit of prophecy says, the extreme short dress reaching about to the what? Is worn by a certain class. Boy, man, if she was living today, she said back then, he was short. Now they're wearing it way above it. Am I right? What would the prophet of the Lord say today? Let me ask you a question. Does the Bible say in like manner that women adorn themselves in sexy apparel? Does the Bible say that? You know the Bible didn't say that. Amen? What kind of apparel? Now, how many of you got sons in here, grown sons that are single? All right. Okay, you got a grown son. Okay. Say, okay. Your husband, come, your, say if your son comes home, and if you had to judge him based on how they dress, because you got just a character too, see if they're going to be a good wife for your son. Your son brings somebody looking like this at home. What would you say just from the top of your head if you had to judge it based on how she looked? Oh, nice. praise the Lord, right? <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> it paid off. Am I right? <laughs> Or like this, and let me, can I be honest with you? I have, I have a 350 slide presentation on jewelry and adornment, so this is really the short version of it. It was hard to find decently dressed women on the end. It was hard. It was, Nicole, it was hard. I mean, hard. I'm like, so, so when I show the students this, see, you don't have a problem with it. Your people be like, I don't want to dress like that. So I got to say, I'm just giving you an example. It was hard, but anything else, it's easy to find the wrong. Am I right? But if you seek, you shall find too, right? But if your son brought somebody home looking like that, what would you say if you had to judge it based on appearance? Oh, we need to um, have some Bible studies with her, right? Or you'd be like, oh, no, please. Don't. All right. No, the Bible says what kind of apparel, somebody? Modest apparel. And let me tell you, it is extremely important. So you know a Muslim when you see him, am I right? You know a Muslim lady when you see him, am I right? And God is not requiring women to dress like that. These hands right here. But they are modest, am I right, somebody? I ain't talking about the ones over inside, I'm talking about the ones over here, am I right? You know it immediately when you see it. And when you go out in public, people should know that you're a Christian. If they didn't know you as an Adam, they should know you're a Christian. There have been women. I've been able to look. I said, you go to church, don't you? How did you know? I just know. Because how they dressed. Watch this right here. Modesty is a what kind of arrangement? See, when you're in Christ, let me ask you a question. What must you wear to be saved? Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when you have Christ and his character, his spirit will convict you. You need to dress like me. Didn't the Bible say that Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation? He wasn't trying to be seen. Am I right? But see, immodesty wants to be seen. Am I right, somebody? So what happens is this right here. Modesty is an orderly arrangement of clothes that does not hide the inner or what? Immodesty leads to what? And other sins. And let me tell you something. When we understand Christ, that he didn't. No, we got to dress. We got to wear clothes. Am I right, somebody? We are told to be to look good and becoming. Am I right? Okay, we're not, we're not talking about to look like scarecrows. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, you know, one thing we're having in our schools and our churches is fashion shows, and people be people be walking down. They be doing their catwalk. I'm like, what are they doing? So if they go, if we're gonna have it, let's have a Christian modesty one, showing how they're supposed to really dress. Now that may not be attended by as much people, but that's the truth. But if we would have a Christian modesty contest, would she win hands down? If you were the judge in the panel, of course she would. Am I right? She would win it. She'll probably win another one, or something like that. But modesty and dress, you know this is true, does not give you permission to dress like a scarecrow. The gospel is balanced. Amen. Amen. I like looking nice in the suit and a tie. These hands right here. And, you know, make sure everything's in order because in heaven it's all order and beauty. Am I right, somebody? But watch this right here. So we got to understand that modesty and dress teaches us that it's not a sin to what, somebody? To look nice. So it's not a sin to look nice. Now what happens is this right here, the standard on jewelry is going down. I'm seeing more jewelry now than ever before. And what happens is you got to, and I have to deal with it in a redemptive way. And there are times you got to hit it hard. There are times you got to walk people through it because some folks just don't know. Can I tell you a true story? <laughs> About, this is 2015. I can't believe that we're in 2015. Anyway, about 2001, 2002, I was preaching a sermon at a church in Indiana. 
What state did I say? And the title of my sermon was going to be called, Will the Real Seven Day Event Please Please Stand Up? Had, a, had my sermon all down. And this is before PowerPoint. And I walked in that church, Elder Lewis, and I walked in. I was wondering, am I in the right church? I'm on the right day. Everybody. When I say everybody, these were not visitors. These were members. Everybody, elders, pianists, everybody had jewelry. I ain't talking about a ring here, too. People had earrings on, decked out. I said, whoa. I said, I got to change my message. You know what I preached about? This subject from the Bible. Amen. All through the Bible, the spirit of prophecy. And do you know, at the end of service, at fellowship dinner, I was the loneliest man at fellowship dinner. <laughs> the elders were going at They were going after me. They said, you told the truth. But they were arguing with me at the same time. And then I'm sitting down eating my food like I got to eat, eat, get up out of here. A lady came in front of me and her husband. They had their jewelry on. I said, oh, they're going to let me have it. <laughs> they said, we want to thank you, Pastor, for telling us this. We've been here for four and a half years, and nobody never told us. And we're going to take it off. Amen? Amen? So what happens is this right here. The Lord showed me you can't judge. You can't judge because you, you don't know what led to all that. Amen? And that's why we got to be redemptive in how we deal with people. Amen? Now watch this right And let me tell you, I had one of my students, um, and she told me struggle. She had a struggle with dresses on another issue. She said that because that she was born, she was born with a black birthmark all over her body. So she thought she was ugly and attractive, so she had to do certain things. And the Lord had, and she said that now the Lord is helping her to get out of that shell. So that's why I'm saying that you got to walk people through some things. Am I right, somebody? Amen. Now watch this right here. The Bible says his will for jewelry, it's other scriptures, not with broidered hair or gold or what, somebody? Pearls or costly what? All right. We teach people from the Bible that we are not to adorn ourselves with jewelry. You understand this right here? Now, can we talk about the red ring for a minute? I know that's permissible. I know it's allowed, but I want you to think about something. I want you to do what, somebody? Think about it, okay? I'm just going to give it to you, and then you make your own decision. Now, watch this right here. The wedding ring. Is it customary? Of course it is. Now, watch this right here. It's customary. Spirit of Prophecy talks about this issue where she, in essence, says not one what? Should be spent for a circle of gold to testify that we are what? Married. Now, she talks about other stuff in here. She talks about the imperative in other countries where it's imperative. We're not talking about that right here. But she saw a leavening process to where the wedding ring would be a problem. And what happens is, even though it's been allowed, I'm going to tell you this right now, young people aren't thinking about like the older folk looking at it. Young people say, oh, if you can wear it yet, I can wear my studs. And I got to fight. I got to, not so much fight. I got to deal with this because they're seeing these things. Let me tell you something. I got to be careful what I say in class. Because let me tell you this right here, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you this right here. Young people look for consistency. Am I right, somebody? If I say one thing and there's a contradiction, they're going to call me out on it. Are you with me? Now, sometimes they get over, over where I'm talking about. They, get, they, get, they go too far and say, you got a tie on. You know, come on. I mean, you know, I'm not going to get into all that. But let me share this with you. Now, when you do your research, what you will find out, that the wedding ring is really a pagan symbol. It really is. Now, from this Catholic priest here, talked about some things here and he talked about different things that came into the church where he said the ring and what and other things are all of what and sanctified by their adoption into the what church now watch this right here now I say here the wedding ring represents Lucifer himself why would I say something like that you do your research now Dr. Samuel Bakayoki wrote a book on this he brought it out very clearly that the historical significance of the wedding ring that on the first day of the week which is what somebody in honor of the sun god, they will wear a ring of gold because gold was the color of the sun. And the gem of the day to receive the power of the sun would be a diamond. When the sun would hit the diamond, the diamond would what, somebody? Reminding you of his original name, which means what? Light bearer. And the reason why it's worn on this hand, on this finger, is because in paganism, back, back Yoki brought it out, it was dedicated to the sun god. So what happened? I let the young people know, look here, this is what it, now you can do whatever you want to do with it. But what happens is right here, I want to let you know what the real meaning is so you can make an informed decision. Do you understand this right here? Because boy, if I had 666 on my, sh on my coat, what would you tell me to do? This is just numbers, man. I don't mean anything. I can't say that. Now, for the young people that really know what's going on, if, you, if people don't believe things don't mean things, if I had a ring in my tongue. There's some of there are people in the world who know what that means. It does not mean anything modest. It means something very immoral. So rings do have meaning. But watch this right here. 
So what happens is this right here. This is going on, and then people not reading their Bible no more. Thy word have I, and this is a, it's an iPad, but thy word have I hid in my what? That I might not what? The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before my what? The Bible says, whatsoever things is just, true, pure, honest, virtue, there be any good report, if there be any virtue, there be any what? Do what? I'm a young man, and let me tell you this right here. I've been there, and I've done that. And I know that these movies here are not inspired by God. Can we agree? Wasn't there a time when we used to teach against going to the theater? We used to teach that. I mean, C.D. Brooks, I mean, he still teaches this. He's probably one of the few that still talk about it. He said that was the biggest struggle. Dean Zan is right here. Because why? Because let me tell you this. Steven Spielberg, you know who Steven Spielberg is? One of the greatest producers of all time said that when you go into a theater, you are buying yourself into manipulation. There's a video done by a non-seven-day event. It's called Hollywood Unmasked. Part one and part, you need to look at it. Hollywood Unmasked. It looked like he had been reading Ellen G. White, but he wasn't. But what happened was he just reasoned from common sense and showed different clips showing that these movies are contributing to the destruction of society. And that's what the prophet of the Lord said, that there's no influence in this country more powerful to destroy religious impressions than theatrical amusements. And that's why we were told to shun the theater. Now, with the Internet today, I don't have to go to uh, AMC. I can go to my iPad. Am I right, somebody? I can go to YouTube, and let me tell you, I got to tell you a story. It's funny now, because one day, you know, because what happens, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to say. It, have you heard this before? That your angel will not go with you to the movies. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Cinema. How does cinema spell over here? Yes, I am. Because something that's going on in here is something that should not be watched. Let me tell you this right here. There's a lot of truth to this. And a student was challenging me yesterday. I was talking about this yesterday in class, and they were challenging me on that stuff. But I had to reason with them based on what I'm about to tell you now. You know, sometimes when you're teaching this stuff, you're trying to stay separate from the world. We're walking in Christ. Um, you may have a weak moment. Am I right, somebody? All right. One day I was watching TV. I'm flipping the channels. And usually when I flip the channels, I do a lot of finger exercises because there's nothing to watch on TV. So you're trying to pass in time, 9.30 at night. And then on a certain station... It was a clip. I said, hold up. Let me look at that. Lord said, don't look at it. Dr. Parker, that 30 seconds turned into 30 minutes. That 30 minutes turned into one hour. And that thing got so juicy, I could, did not even go to the bathroom. Are you with me? <laughs> and at the end, and it was, it was all about sin and all that kind of stuff. But it was that kind of juicy plot, like a novel or a soap opera. Hello. And I said, Lord, have mercy on me. I knew that the devil had got me. Now, I wasn't looking for it. Are you with me? But when it, remember David and Bathsheba? Where he was walking outside and he saw Bathsheba? Was the sin that he saw Bathsheba? The sin was when he continued to do what? To linger. And let me tell you this right here, man. And that thing got so juicy. I said, it was, it was a thing called, it was part two of a certain series. I said, I got to watch part three. <laughs> and I got to watch part one. Are you with me? But what happened was I said, Lord, forgive me. Why? Because I lent my mind unto worldliness. Thank God it wasn't porn. Thank God it wasn't anything degrading. But let me tell you, it was just as bad. Dean is this right here. And it took my mind off of Christ. And it put my mind on worldly things. So I, un I know from personal experience. So when I teach this stuff, I don't teach it as I'm so holy and you're so this. Oh, no. We all in this thing together. There's some things that it is no struggle for me. There's some things that God has said to me in his word. It is not a struggle for me. But there are some things I got to run away. Am I right? There is, I'm from Washington, D.C. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I have preached all over this country. But there has been one place I have never been able to really preach on on a regular basis. And that is Washington, D.C. And when I have preached there, I can't stay no more than a couple of days. You know why? Because those old demons, the Lord knows, are waiting for me. So I'm just going to hold back on some engagements. So are you with me until God gives me the strength? You understand this right here? So I know my limits. Listen to what Sister White says. Watch this right here. Many place themselves on what kind of ground? By frequenting scenes of amusement, where what? If, if she's a prophet, you got to believe it from God. Professing Christian, when you resort to the theater, remember who is there? When you go on this scene, you take a look at that. Satan is there, 
Then she says, conducting the what? As the master actor. That means they had actors and plays back in her day. I keep hearing this. I, nobody's never been able to show me. Oh, back then it was like this. It was like it is today, Dr. O. Let me tell you something. There is no new thing under the what? Now, if Satan's conducting the play, that means he's controlling the screenwriters. Are you with me? He's controlling the producers. And even in Hollywood Unmasked, he, one of the producers said that the thing we love about this is we get a chance to smuggle ideas. And now you're seeing gay commercials now. Yeah. Last week, two weeks ago, for the first time in my life, I'm just minding my business. <laughs> Bam, it was right in my face. Two men holding hands, walking in the sunset. Two women about to kiss, about to get married. And it was a gay, I'm like, I didn't know the LGBT movement was going to try to get into television. Oh, we thought it was just civil unions, right? Oh, no, they want to control everything. These are this right here. And possibly to try to make Christian schools teach it. Are you with me? But we're going to take a stand against it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Watch this right here. He is there to excite what? Man, there's some movie. Have you ever watched a movie that made you so mad? Made you want to kill the person in the movie? Let's be honest with you. Am I the only one being honest in here? Maybe, you, maybe you, have, you haven't watched it, but let me tell you this. He is there to excite passion and glorify what? And the very atmosphere is permeated with what? That's why we got to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Because, see, let me tell you, nobody, for the most part, preaches against preachers on this anymore. I mean, for the, I mean, people still talk about dress and other things, but when it comes to this right here, you got leaders promoting this stuff. Are you with me? But what we got to do is we got to get back to the blueprint. You understand this right here? And getting back to the blueprint means getting back into Christ. Because when you're in Christ, you are in what kind of creature? And I've had to, and the Lord has convicted me. No sanctified mind can take pleasure in watching scenes of sin. Am I right? This is a movie. This is the wife. He's doing something that he should not be doing. But people say, oh, this is real life. There's some things in real life that do not need to be seen. Am I right? Watch this right here. And then what happened this right here, people watching this stuff, then guess what? Subconsciously, the devil can whisper and say, don't you want to do that? Am I right? Or if you don't do it, then to accept it. Because let me tell you this right here. People knock on the homosexuals and stuff like that saying they're so wrong. But guess what? We've been seeing fornication for the last generation on television to where people think it's okay to have sex outside of marriage. And the thing about the LGBT movement, but let's just take the LGBT movement and just throw it out the window. The thing about fornication and adultery, it destroys the foundation of the family. Because Hollywood, through the music and through the screen, is not thinking about Philippians 4 8 when they make these movies for our children and for us as adults. What they're trying to do is to smuggle in another thought, a way of thinking to make you think that what the Bible says is outdated. If you don't believe me, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat the forbidden fruit. Am I right? The devil came in with another worldview. Am I right? And said, well, what you need to understand is when you eat it, you're going to go to a higher state. You're going to have some fun. And look what we're in right now. Because somebody decided to accept Satan's worldview. And let me tell you this. And Dr. Parker will tell you. Pastor Lewis will tell you, will tell you, postmodernism is in the church. To where I'm battling with folk who believe that truth is relative now. What may be true for you may not be true for me, et cetera, et cetera. But boy, let me tell you this right here. It is destroying confidence in the Bible as a revelation from God. It's destroying confidence in the spirit of prophecy as a revelation from God. And it's destroying an absolute Jesus from being a Lord in your life. To where another Jesus is being created is causing a leaping compromise, not only in Adventism, but worldwide to accept Satan when he comes as the false Christ. To where the devil will say everybody can be saved. It doesn't matter how you live. Heaven will be your home. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Liberal theology is leading to a liberal Christian what? But what happens is this right here. We got to be burdened. But the Philistines did what to Samson? Took his eyes out. I mean, come on, he didn't have no strength already. But they said, we're going to make sure that you have not only no power, but you have no vision. And back then in them days, they didn't put, no, they didn't put you to sleep. Who ever had surgery? Who's ever had surgery before? 
they put you to sleep, right? Did they tell you to count from 300 backwards? I would lay on the table one time and say, count from 300 backwards. When I got to 294, I was gone. You hear me? But what happened, they didn't put them on anesthesia. They did it without any kind of deadening of pain and took a poker and poked it in his eyes. And he poked his eyes out. He became the laughing stock of the Philistines. But what happened was the devil wants to poke out the eyes of the seven day of in the church. And what are the eyes of the church called? The Bible says before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake and said, come, let us go to the who? Yeah. For he that is now called a what? What's before time called a what? A seer. What there is no vision, the people what? A perish. And let me tell you this right here. The eyes of Samson, the eyes of God's church symbolize the prophetic gift. Where God's given us not only a prophetic understanding of Daniel, one eye, and Revelation, the two eyes. Are you with me? He's given us the prophetic gift of this servant of the Lord to serve as the spiritual eyes of the SDA church, providing prophetic guidance, seeing past, present, and what else, somebody? So what happens is it's very important, as Ted Wilson is talking about and others are talking about, we need to be, and it has to be a true Christ in the revival and reformation. Am I right, somebody? God's given us the word. He's given us the testimonies to outline the way. But too many people say, I can't what? See what's wrong. Why? Because the eyes have been poked up. And it is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people and the what, somebody? And boy, let me tell you, it's one thing when you got non-Adventists putting stuff out against Ellen White. But you got seven-day Adventists. You got some smart Alex. Am I right? In the church. That will try to make you think that what she wrote in some places was her own opinion. Now, of course, when she said it was 38, it was 40 rooms, but it was really 38. We're not talking about that. We're talking about stuff that calls for change in your life. Folk don't want to see that. Folk don't want a Lord to rule over them. Do you understand this right here? But let me tell you this. God will have a remnant. He will have a people that will be faithful and firm and true who love Jesus enough to follow him till death. Let me tell you a story before we close. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God where there is no vision the people will what? Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true what? It's going on through so many ways and one of them, I mean this is one of the most brightest minds this church has ever put out. I mean he's not in the church now. Um, Desmond Ford I, I you know, for years, I, didn't, I would never listen to his sermons, but on YouTube, I said, let me, just, let me just hear what they talk about this man. I knew he was wrong, but let me tell you, when I listened to that man, I had to turn, I had to turn it off because he sounded very convincing. You understand this right here? So what happens is this right here, and we thank God that, um, that um, the Lord prevailed, and what happened was his deceptions have been unveiled, but the spirit of this man still lives. And, they, and it's a saying that goes, if you want to be immortal in the church, be a teacher. If you want to be immortal, you know only God's immortal, but just a figure of speech. Be a teacher. But watch this right here. I got some good news for you. See, what they forgot is that when you cut somebody's hair, well, mine's is not growing back, okay? And so it's like, I wish I could just grow it, you know. But watch this right here. How be it? The hair of his head began to what? After he was what? And as it was growing again, Guess what happened to his strength? He was coming back. Remember that? I don't know if you saw this. It's, it was when I was a child. It was about the little train that could. I think I can. I think I can. And as he started to believe, he got stronger and stronger. Let me tell you something. As his hair began to grow, his strength came back. Now, and this time, he didn't tell nobody that his strength came back. Because remember, last time he betrayed his secret, they stopped it. But when he realized his strength came back, he said, Lord, avenge me for my two eyes. Am I right? And he put his hand on how many pillars? Two pillars. And you know what that, you know the rest of the story. Even though Samson's compromises led to his downfall temporarily, there was a revival and reformation. Amen. To where the latter part of Samson's ministry, the scripture says that he slew more in that one time than he did in his whole time of being a judge. I got some good news for you. The best days of Adventism are before us. The pioneers should have been living in our day. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to die. 
I pray to God, I, I pray to God I live to see this thing. Because I've been preaching it. I've been believing this thing. I'm like Peter, as Ellen White said. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah from the beginning. You hear me? I believe this is true. I want to see this thing come to pass. And I want to be one of those that's going to stand. I want to be one of those that vindicate the character of God. I want to be one of those that love Christ so much to where I would rather die than commit one wrong act. Do you want to have that love? He can give you that love right now. And you can cultivate that love. Revival and reformation. And brothers and sisters, God is going to do some good stuff for us. So as we close, I want you to keep your eyes on this man. He's the only man that you need to keep your eyes on. And his name is the lovely Jesus. Amen. And by looking to him and by receiving, not just looking unto Jesus, but by receiving strength from him. Because let me tell you this. Jesus is all power is given unto me in heaven and in what? We're told in the spirit of prophecy that that power is to be our power. Amen. So we can receive that power today. We can receive that power tomorrow. You can receive that power on a daily basis. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to grow more and more like Jesus. And be less and less like the world. And you know what's going to happen? Your discernment will be more sharper. The things that you didn't see anything wrong, you're like, oh, that's what the pastor was talking about. Oh, that's what the Lord was talking about. Jesus, I love you more than that. Amen? And you're going to be like a man that Joe Cruz told. That's a story I'm going to tell you. He's a man, and I think it was in Pakistan. His name was Sadiq. And Joe Cruz, in his book, Reigns of My Life, talked about a time when he did a crusade in 1956. He ran the crusade for, for quite a while. And it was a man, you know, at the end of the crusade, people got baptized. And at the end of the crusade, they were, I mean, they were getting ready to, to load up. This man, this Muslim man, Sada, comes in and he says, baptize me, baptize me, quick, 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 baptize me right now. And Elder Cruz said, you didn't come to the meeting. I can't baptize you. He said, I didn't come inside the tent because I'm a Muslim. And in my country, if they would have caught me going into that tent, I would be in trouble. But what I would do, he, every day, he would walk past the tent. And rather than go inside, he would sit outside under the palm tree and listen to the gospel of Jesus. And for the time that he heard him, he was convicted to give his life to Christ. And he said, I'm going to become a Christian and join the seventh day of his church. So he said, Elder Cruz, I went home and told my wife that I'm going to be a seventh day of his Christian. We're going to become Christians. And the next day, when I came back to work, my job was taken away. And when I went back home to get my wife until I got fired, my father-in-law came and took my wife and my three children away. When I came back to the house to reason with my in-laws to give me my wife back, they wouldn't talk to me. And, the, and, and when he was talking to Joe Cruz, he had bumps and scars all over his body. Why? Because friends and family and acquaintances turned on him for being a Christian and beat him up. And he said, Joe Cruz, can you please baptize me? I believe in the message. And he baptized him in Jesus' name. And he became a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And a year later, when Joe Cruz was going back home to America, as he's going back home, Sadiq said, "My brother," and he became a faithful member of the church. Never got his wife back. Never got his children back. Never got his job back. He said, "Elder Cruz, can you promote me to be a missionary in Pakistan, where I can sell Bibles throughout Pakistan?" Now, you can sell Bibles in America with no problem, but can you sell Bibles in Pakistan? Oh no. He said, I can't endorse you, because if I do that, they will kill you. But you know what his response was? He said, I don't care. He loved Jesus so much. Though he lost his job, he lost everything. He lost everything. But he loved Jesus so much, and he was willing to lay down his very life for him. I don't know what happened to Sodom, but I believe that if he remained faithful, he's going to see Jesus. And God's going to restore unto him the years, which the locusts have eaten. Brothers and sisters, it's easier to be a it's easier to be a Christian in America than it is in some countries. Even in this country, it's easier to be a Christian than it was in other years. But let me tell you, it's going to get very, very difficult. You know what the Scripture says: No man be able to buy or what. Every earthly support is going to be cut off. Jesus said that. Your own family is going to betray you. It didn't tell, it didn't mention your it didn't say your cousins or your distant. It could be your spouse. It could be your mama. It could be your pappy. Are you with me? It could be anybody who's not in Christ. And God's going to allow the time of trouble to come to see how much you love Jesus 
And let me tell you this. I can say I love Jesus with all my heart. But if I'm not surrendered to God on everything, I'll sell him out. Remember Peter? Oh, he knew he was going to stand for the Lord. Am I right? But Jesus said, you're not converted. In essence. And then he said, you're going to deny me three times. Like, what? I'll never deny you, Lord. And Jesus never lies. Am I right? But guess what happened a couple of hours later? I don't know who that man is. I'm going to show you. I'm not an admin. I'm a cuss. Are you with me, right? And then, ooh, ooh, ooh. The cock crowed. And then Sister White says that the faces of Peter and Jesus met. Have you ever been caught with your hands in a cookie jar? And you got caught. You could not lie your way out of it. But when he saw Jesus, see if it had been some of us, mm -hmm. yeah, I knew he was going to do it. That would have broken Peter's heart. And he would have probably never came back to the Lord. But the Lord, the servant Lord says that Jesus looked on Peter with love and compassion. You know why? Because he didn't look at Peter as he was right then. He saw Peter seven, eight weeks later on the day of Pentecost standing for him. Are you with me? And it broke Peter's heart. And it got converted. And then God gave him another chance on Pentecost. And then he told us probably the same folk that he denied Jesus to that Jesus is the Christ. That's going to be our test. Do you love him more than you love your wife? Hello? Do you love him more than you love your husband? Do you love him more than you love your job? Do you love him more than your life? We got to come to the point where we love Jesus and his word, just as he's given it to us, more than anything else. And when his church gets to that point, there will be no more leaping compromise. The church militant we will become the church triumphant. Do you want to be a part of that church, brothers and sisters? But if you want to be a part of that church, we can't jump the ship. Are you with me? It's going through. Let's stay in this a little bit longer. Amen.